Good morning and welcome. I'm John Knapp, president of Hope College, and I am pleased to welcome those who are here at the college for today's program, but also those who are watching us on live stream from several other universities and corporations who have tuned in for this event. Hope College is a relatively new member of the World Affairs Council as an educational partner, and we are very pleased to host Great Decisions programs on the Hope College campus. Today's program focuses on North Korea. I had the opportunity several years ago to spend about a week in North Korea as part of an academic humanitarian delegation to the University of Science and Technology in Pyongyang, and I was introduced to speak one morning there, and the introduction went through the usual background and qualifications that I brought to the occasion, and then ended with the words, he is an American imperialist. Well, I hope to give a bit warmer introduction today to our speaker. It was my pleasure last night at Aquinas College to hear Dr. James Person give a talk on North Korean reunification and the prospects, or perhaps lack of prospects for that in the near future. Today, Dr. Person is here at Hope College to continue the conversation about North Korea and to address the question of China-North Korea relations a question that I think is important today and perhaps a topic that's often misunderstood by Americans. Our speaker today, Dr. James Persons, is an, a subject matter expert, a historian from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. in their public policy program. Will you please welcome Dr. Persons to speak to us about the China-North Korea relationship. Thank you very much, President Knapp. Thank you uh, to Hope College and to those of you who are joining us. Uh, thanks also to those of you who are, are joining us uh, um, uh, through uh, uh, our online um, streaming. So happy to be here um, uh, and happy that all of you um, here have joined us despite the, the fog. Um, let me start by saying a few words about the Wilson Center and the work that we do on Korea. Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk about the relationship with, with uh, uh, China, North Korea's relationship with China. The Woodrow Wilson Center was established in 1968 by act of Congress. It's a, uh, um, a living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. President Wilson was the only U.S. president to have a Ph.D. Uh, he uh, was, before he went into public service, he was an academic taught at Princeton University, became president of Princeton University. Um, and he uh, uh, believed, even after going into public service, that, that it, was the, um, it was possible to bring scholars and public officials together to engage in dialogue, discussion, and to inform one another. Uh, he, so uniting the world of ideas with, with the idea of, or with, with the world of, of policy. This is something we try to do at the Wilson Center, is, is to inform policy by, by uh, bringing scholars to the table, uh, having a, a more informed um, uh, policy toward, toward uh, the rest of the world. The Wilson Center is unique in that it has a program that focuses on history, too, uh, the history and public policy program. We try to look at the, uh, the, the long-term trends that, that help, uh, help us better understand what's going on in the world today. And uh, I think that is, is more useful in, in looking at North Korea than, than in most places because uh, of the fact that the North Koreans themselves attach so much importance to their history and to their historical experiences. The big problem, of course, is that um, well, there's this perception that we don't have a whole lot of history to call upon when, when looking at North Korea because the North Koreans are not the most open of, of, of people. Um, we don't have many documents from directly from North Korea. We don't have access to reliable North Korean sources. And so um, uh, there's this perception that North Korea is both unknown and unknowable. At the Wilson Center, we've, we've discovered that this is just not true, that we actually do have much more history to call upon than most people think. And that's because we, we have been able to uh, get into the archives of North Korea's former communist allies. This is something that we've been doing for the past 
two decades. Um, we started by going into the, the Russian archives, gathering documents on the origins of the Korean War. Uh, since then, we've, we've expanded to archives throughout the former uh, communist bloc and also the Chinese archives, um, gathering documents, gathering the diplomatic record of, of North Korea's former and, in the case of China, present communist allies. And this, what I'm talking about here is, is are conversations between North Korean officials and their uh, uh, communist counterparts, uh, and also records, or no, I'm sorry, also uh, um, cables, diplomatic cables that were dispatched from Pyongyang, from the embassies of these countries in Pyongyang to back to their foreign ministries. And these documents and these conversations, they really give us some, some strong insight into what was going on in North Korea throughout the Cold War. They allow us to really step back and ask some very basic epistemological questions about how, how we know what we think we know about North Korea, um, how knowledge was produced about North Korea over the years before these documents became available. And there are, of course, lessons for, for history, but they also help us better inform policy. Uh, they, they help us, they, they put us in a position where we can more accurately interpret North Korea's actions today uh, by identifying these long-term, slow-moving trends in North Korean policy over the years. And um, today I'm gonna talk about um, uh, one area that, that is of interest, both to me as a historian, but also I think that it would be of great interest, uh, or should be of great interest, to the policy community in Washington especially since uh, U.S. policy seems to be um, uh, based on what is essentially a misunderstanding, and that is the relationship between North Korea and China. Before I, I um, uh, start talking about the relationship, though, I wanted to just quickly introduce um, a, uh, the Wilson Center's digital archive. So we now have tens of thousands of documents um, available to us from from all uh, from so many former communist bloc archives, and we're slowly making these available. We're getting them translated, and making them available, uh, free free of charge on on this digital archive um, uh, at at the Wilson Center, uh, and it's uh, uh, has multiple points of access, and it's designed really for anyone. Um, from somebody who is just has, has a, a passive interest in in Korean history, maybe saw you know size video Gangnam style, and you know uh, got a you know a little bit of interest in 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 Korea, so they wanted to learn about Korean history, so they can go on to this digital archive and sort of flip through this timeline and and see uh, some of the flashpoints in modern Korean history. There are also curated collections of documents. I don't. No, let me see if I can pull this mic away and walk over to the computer a little bit, and I'll show some of the features um, just very quickly. Um, so there's the timeline, which actually uh, allows you to scroll through uh, various points in Korean history, um, again, looking at different flashpoints. And the nice thing is there are actually links to um, to documents directly in, in these these brief descriptions of events. Um, you also have, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, you have curated collections of documents uh, on, on different events in, in modern Korean history, things that would be of interest both to scholars and to the policy community. Um, and there are, also, there are other resources, including um, uh, essays by, by some leading scholars in modern Korean history, and uh, there are also biographies of of key actors in, in modern Korean history. Um, so, very proud of this resource. It's, again, it's really designed for everyone from you know, the, the, someone with absolutely no background in Korean history to the advanced researcher that is, is writing a book um, and, and just needs access to, or and needs, needs to see what new documents are out there. Um, but let's focus on, on China-North Korea relations now. So, um, here, I, I encourage you to, to uh, look through some of the, the materials that we've made available. They come from archives around the world, uh, including 
uh, many Chinese documents, many Russian documents, uh, East German, Bulgarian, um, and they describe the relationship between North Korea and China over the past seven plus decades. And you know, I mentioned before, um, uh, these, these documents really allow us to step back and ask very basic epistemological questions. Uh, so questions about how we know what we think we know. And for some reason, for the past, um, at least the past, you know, almost 40 years now, um, when the Carter administration, which was in the late 1970s, preparing to normalize relations with China, we decided that we were going to rely on what we believed to be China, or China's influence over North Korea to, uh, to actually to, to deal with, the, with, with North Korea. We, we thought that it would be best, since we had no interest ourselves in talking directly with North Korea, that we were just gonna rely on China's influence. And this has been the default policy of the United States ever since. Uh, there have been times when we've talked directly with the North Koreans, but we keep going back to this position of let's, let's allow China to use its influence over North Korea. And this is really based on a misunderstanding. Going back seven plus decades, we can see from these materials that there is a profound sense of mistrust between China and North Korea. And although China and North Korea both use some different slogans in, in their, their propaganda when they're celebrating various anniversaries, they talk about being as close as lips and teeth, suggesting a, a level of intimacy that, that uh, between the two states that you know, goes beyond most the, the relationship between both states. They talk about an alliance forged in blood um, because, of course, China did, Chinese People's Volunteers did enter into the Korean War and uh, fought alongside the North Koreans um, against the United, the United States, the Republic of Korea, and, and other nations that fought, under, uh, fought against the, the uh, Chinese and North Korean um, forces uh, under the UN banner. The, um, what we can see from these materials, though, is that this, this sense of mistrust goes back to the, in fact, to the Korean War. And, and interestingly, this is the, when, when you ask American officials in Washington, you, you know, you say, well, you know, you keep saying China holds all, all the cards, you know, China's the, the, the solution to, to the North Korea problem, we need to get China to do more. You ask them, why do you believe that? And they'll, they'll, they'll point to, they'll say, well, you know, because the Chinese helped the North Koreans during the Korean War. And you remind them that a lot can happen in seven, de in seven decades. Um, but uh, there, again, but for some reason, this perception remains. So you try to get them to look at these documents. But uh, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, few people in, in Washington recognize or want to recognize the value of these historical materials. But uh, so, you know, it's an uphill battle. But um, one, I think that, that you know, we're, we're going to keep trying to push. We're going to keep trying to, to um, uh, show that, 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 in fact, the relationship between China and North Korea based on, on these historical materials is not as close as everyone thinks. And that um, we really need to rethink our policy. So. Let's look at some of the flashpoints then in this relationship. Why is the relationship not as good as we think it is? Um, it really goes back to the Korean War, as I said. Uh, during the Korean War, um, Chinese people's volunteers were dispatched starting in, in late October, November 1950, uh, as UN and, and South Korean forces were approaching the border with China. Um, China, of course, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, in 1949, had just um, succeeded in, in, in kicking out the, uh, the nationalists who fled to Taiwan uh, in October and ending um, the, the revolution on the mainland. Um, so they were still quite insecure. And to have UN forces on their border, US troops on their border, was, was quite, um, they, were, they were a bit un, unsettled about that. And so, they committed Chinese people's volunteers uh, to help the North Koreans. Um, and, and the North Koreans, we could see from quite early on, 
were uncomfortable with, with the presence of this. I mean, while they were happy to be rescued, they were quite uncomfortable with, the, with this, this foreign military apparatus taking control of field operations. And we see from the materials that, in fact, there were a lot of disputes between North Korea and China uh, during the war over, for example, the use of, of trains. So from, 19, from June 1950, or I'm sorry, 51, from June 1951, truce talks started. Of course, they carried on for, for the next two years. But uh, once these truce talks actually started, the North Koreans wanted to begin focusing on reconstruction efforts. And so they, they, they uh, tried to use tr their, their own trains to start uh, transporting goods and, and whatnot so that they could actually begin in reconstruction or begin the process of reconstruction. The Chinese People's Volunteers uh, opposed this. However, they, they refused to allow trains to be used for anything other than military purposes. And this led to uh, a number of conflicts uh, during which the, the trains basically stood still and were targets of American bombers. So the, the uh, infrastructure was being damaged even more as a result of this, of, of this conflict. It, this conflict was resolved only when uh, China uh, insisted that a, a vice minister of transportation from China be appointed. And the North Koreans agreed to this reluctantly, but of course they were quite resentful because this, they perceived this as a, a real intervention in, in their, their domestic politics. There were also uh, some conflicts over, over military strategy between North Korea and, and China. Uh, and the head of the Chinese People's Volunteers, a man called Peng Dohe, uh, was quite dismissive of the North Korean leader, Kim Il-sung. Um, and and um, uh, this is something that 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 uh, the that Kim Il Sung never really uh, forgave forgave China for um, for having for having dispatched somebody who was so disrespectful to to uh, the, the head of their country. Uh, fast forward a, a few a few years to 1956, and you have this this pivotal event in the history of 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 North Korea. Um, you have, after the war, this, uh, the, the war ended with an armistice in 1953, and North Korea then began to really focus on reconstruction. But you have within the country, within the leadership of the country, um, uh, of North Korea, you have, the, you have a, a clash of political cultures. Um, you have those that, that are, are and this, this class is centered on, on economic development strategies. So how do you reconstruct the nation? On one side, you had, you had those who were following uh, policies that were being implemented in, in the Soviet Union and, and, and China, uh, where they were focusing more on consumer goods, light industry. Uh, on the other side, you had, you had Kim Il-sung, the, the North Korean leader, who was really pushing this idea of, of, el of eliminating colonial era distortions to the Korean national economy. Remember that Korea was a colony of Japan for over 35 years, um, from 1910 to 1945, until it was liberated uh, and divided um, uh, by the Allies. Um, but the Korean economy before, or during the colonial period, was, um, uh, you had highly extract, or you had highly developed extractive and primary processing industries, but they didn't have the ability to, to produce spare parts or finished goods. And so Kim Il-sung wanted to eliminate these colonial era distortions to the national economy and have an economy that was more fully developed, that was more interdependent, uh, that wasn't so, so uh, dependent on, on, on outside countries, such as Japan, for example, or now that um, the country was, was liberated, uh, on new allies, the Soviet Union and China. So he wanted um, to uh, have a more fully developed national economy. Um, so there was this clash over, over development strategies. On top of this, you began to have a clash of political cultures. And you also had a, a uh, clash within the leadership on um, uh, on, on which, what the um, economic, or sorry, what the uh, uh, educational and cultural practice or policies of North Korea should be. 
Again, you had those who were influenced by the Soviet Union and China versus Kim Il-sung, who was trying to promote this uh, sense of national pride in, in North Korea. So in 1956, things all come to a head, and, and, and uh, Kim Il-sung, who, is, who sees this opposition to his policies as really a challenge to his national security imperatives, purges those who were supporting pro-China and pro-Soviet pro policies. He saw them as conduits of outside influence. And, and as long as these people served in positions within the, the, the administration, they would continue to serve the interests of China and, and, and the Soviet Union. So he purged them. Um, and uh, China responded by dispatching a delegation headed by Peng Dehui, the head of the Chinese People's Volunteers, the guy who continuously dis disrespected him throughout the Korean War. So Peng Dehui goes and investigates what happened in, 19, in, in, in August of 1956, and he forces Kim Il-sung to release people from prison, people who were legitimate, legitimately imprisoned, forces, them, or, or forces Kim Il-sung to release them so that they can accompany him back to China, uh, forces him to actually call for a, a new meeting where he admits mistakes, admits that, that he shouldn't have purged people and, and, and forcing him to change policy. Clearly, there was a lot of meddling in the, the affairs of, a, of another country. And this is something that you see in the decades later where, where the North Koreans continue to feel that this is something, that, you know, that, that they were, there was, this was a great injustice, that this was uh, something that, that one state should not have done to another sovereign you know, state. Um, fast forward again a few more years to the mid-1960s. You have the Cultural Revolution in China. Relations between North Korea and China just collapsed during this, this, this period. And, and they got so bad that you had armed clashes on the border in the vicinity of, of Pekdu Mountain. You had Chinese troops occupying North Korean, a North Korean town. Kim Il-sung, who was, of course, still the leader in North Korea, issued an order to attack and to take only a handful of prisoners, but, but to kill the rest. This isn't something you would expect from two allies that are as close as lips and teeth. Chinese Red Guards uh, were publishing, uh, on a regular basis, newspaper articles calling for Kim Il-sung's overthrow. He was described as a fat revisionist who sat on the fence in the Sino-Soviet split. Ethnic Koreans were being rounded up in, in Manchuria and northeast China. They were executed, and their bodies were being thrown onto trains that were going into. They were supposed to be carrying goods into South into uh, North Korea, but instead the, they were uh, the, the Red Guards were, were piling these 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 uh, the bodies of, of ethnic Koreans onto these trains with signs strapped to the body saying things like uh, "This is going to happen to you next, you little revisionist." So again, not something you would expect from, from close allies. This was, uh, so relations completely broke down between North Korea and China during this period and never really recovered. You can see in the diplomatic record that, that uh, after this, this, this period, um, the North Koreans understood the need to work with China again, but, but they, they, there was always going to be some, they were always going to hold back and, and uh, uh, there was never really a, a fully restored um, confidence in, in, in China. Um, in, 19, uh, in, in the late 1970s, of course, China begins its economic reform movement under Deng Xiaoping, and we begin to see the interests of North Korea and China really diverging. As China was becoming more, in, more and more integrated into the global economy, uh, was uh, interested in, in lessening tensions with, with uh, the capitalist uh, uh, world, and um, North Korea uh, remained um, a revolutionary state and, and, and 
didn't want to follow the same path. And so you see this, again, the, the interests of the two states diverging. And then in 1980, when the North Koreans announced that Kim Jong-il would be the, officially announced that Kim Jong-il would be the successor to Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il being Kim Il-sung's son, the Chinese openly criticized the decision to have hereditary succession in a communist state. Now, up through the, the late 19th century, it was the prerogative of the Chinese emperor to confer legitimacy on a Korean king. But for the North Koreans, it was unconscionable that China felt it could voice an opinion on who would lead Korea or lead North Korea in 1980. And so this, again, led to another downturn in, in, in the relationship. And there are many other incidents, many other events, um, as, as, as the, two, the two countries continued to grow further and further apart, as China became more and more integrated into the global economy, as, as China recognized South Korea in the early 90s, uh, primarily because of its economic interests, and essentially abandoned um, the North Koreans uh, at the end of the, of the Cold War, um, leaving them in the cold. Um, so what you can see in these materials, and I, and I hope you all look at, look at some of these, these documents, um, is that there is this profound sense of mistrust. That uh, the North Koreans are essentially saying, we don't trust China and we never will. So you wonder how, in the United States, we arrive at this position that the very best way to, to deal with the North Koreans is to rely on China's what we believe to be China's influence. Clearly, China has more access than any other country in the world. They also have more economic leverage. But this isn't something that they can use. Why? If they, you, you should think of their economic leverage not as an instrument, but think of it like as, an, as an, a fine instrument that could be, you know, where they could uh, maybe uh, shut off the oil here or there. Think of it as a hammer, or even a sledgehammer. It's going to bring about collapse, and this is the last thing that, that China wants. They don't want instability on their border. China, of course, right now is having, um, there are some economic issues they're dealing with, and the last thing they want is instability on their border. They also don't want this, this influx of, of refugees from North Korea for a number of reasons. Number one, the, you know, because of economic concerns, you don't want a, a sudden influx of people across the border. You also have to consider the, the health, um, the implications of, of, of having um, uh, all of these refugees coming across the border from, from a place where there is essentially no health care system, no inoculation from, from various viruses. A colleague of mine is... Uh, describe North Korea as being one one pandemic away from collapse, um, and you know imagine, for example, uh, um, what what could happen if if you have another uh, SARS or, or MERS, and 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 just how these people who who are already malnourished and and um, just how susceptible they would be to to uh, disease and and uh, uh, viruses and whatnot and the, the potential health risks from this. Um, so China cannot use its, its economic leverage over North Korea. At the same time, they don't have the, the influence the, or the ability to influence North Korean policy because of this profound sense of mistrust that goes back seven plus decades. So the question again, why, why, why does the United States continue to, ma to maintain this policy after over 35 years of failure that uh, the most effective way to deal with them is to rely on China's leverage or China and, and what we believe to be China's influence. Looking at the documents again, and here not just these materials, but, also, but a lot of U.S. records that have been available for decades, we can see that China, ha or, I'm sorry, that North Korea has in fact been trying to reach out to the United States directly since the early 1970s, since 1974. And you can see that we've largely ignored them. 
um, for good reasons at times. Their proposals were unacceptable. At other times, it, uh, we could say that we ignored them because uh, we just we were stubborn and, 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 and felt that there was no interest or no value in talking to the North Koreans. But I would, I would argue that because of the fact that the North Koreans consistently have tried to reach out to the United States, that we actually have more leverage than anyone. We have more influence than anyone. And if we want to bring an end to this, to this uh, persistent um, security challenge in Northeast Asia, and perhaps even to the suffering of the North Korean people, perhaps it's time that the United States starts to think of using its own influence and, and its own leverage by the fact that North Korea has been trying to talk to us to, to actually talk with them and get them to, to move beyond this thinking that the most effective way to achieve their diplomatic goals is by engaging in provocative actions. This is, of course, going to require a, a, a dramatic change in American thinking Continue to think, of course, that talking is is uh, equal to uh, awarding somebody, and that we should we should punish uh, those that uh, um, that we don't like by not talking to them. You, know, it's, it, it, you hear time and again that that if we do talk to them directly, it would be it would be rewarding bad behavior. Uh, so again, this is going to require a, a significant change in our thinking in Washington. But I, I really believe, again, based on, on these long-term trends, the, on the, this, this long-term overview of, of the relationship between China and North Korea and also between the United States and North Korea, that the most effective way to, to really bring about change on the Korean Peninsula and, and potentially bring about uh, the conditions under which we may see unification at some point in the future, is, is for the United States to get more directly involved. I'd be happy to take questions on, uh, on, on some of the documents or, or, or anything that I've, I've discussed today. I know we also have people uh, texting in questions. So uh, I, I guess you'll just, if, if you wait for the microphone. Uh, we can start it out from our uh, virtual partners here. Northern Michigan University uh, uh, had a question um, very early into your talk. And I think um, you've been talking a lot about China-North Korean relations as well as North Korean and U.S. relations. Uh, but the next piece of the puzzle is South Korea. What can South Korea do to help... Um, minimize some of the um, feelings of being threatened that, that North Korea has today. So, uh, so what can South Korea do to, uh, so providing assurance to, to, to minimize North Korea's threat perception? Yes, yes. The sense that North Korea sees South Korea potentially as just uh, the enemy. How, how did they um, change that perception? Uh, up until recently, uh, we, we, we unfortunately just in the past few weeks, we, we saw the closure of the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which uh, since um, the early 2000s was uh, a vital link to, to North Korea. Um, you know, and we've seen um, uh, until recently a lot of economic linkages developing between between North and South Korea, and I think this this was doing a lot to minimize that that uh, threat perception from from North Korea, um, as South Korea tried to separate politics and and security issues uh, from economic and humanitarian assistance. Um, we're really in in uncharted territory right now. Well. In, not uncharted, but we're going back to a period of, of antagonism, I fear, um, uh, between the two Koreas. Um, starting with, with in, in the late 1990s, when, when this sunshine policy was introduced, you had uh, this delinking uh, between security and, and um, humanitarian assistance and, and economic assistance, and, and you really began to see robust 
uh, exchanges between between North and South Korea, um, partly through the Kaesong Industrial Complex, also from uh, 1998 to 2008 through the uh, Diamond Mountain or the Kumgang Mountain uh, Resorts. Um, we uh, in 2008 that was closed after a, a tourist was was shot, but recently the Kaesong Industrial Complex um, was shut down. Uh, after South Korea alleged that some of the, the earnings were being used to uh, fund the um, nuclear and missile programs in North Korea. Um, I don't know that there really is clear evidence for that. I, I know the Ministry of Unification in Korea is, is under a, a lot of pressure to, to produce uh, uh, proof of this. Um, and to my knowledge, this, they, they really haven't been able to produce any, any convincing Proof and so the Korean National Assembly is in fact quite upset about the 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 fact that um, this one last link uh, that that really um, um, uh, maintained uh, uh, at least um, some you know, por portion of this policy of of, of decoupling or you know de um, uh, policy from and, and security from. Um, from economic and humanitarian assistance to North Korea. Uh, they're, they're upset that this has been shuttered. Um, as are, I think, many people in, 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 the Korean, in the population in South Korea. It's, uh, um, if, if, if somehow we could get back to, to this, this um, uh, to maintaining some uh, relationship on the side through humanitarian assistance and, and through also um, uh, economic linkages, uh, perhaps. I mean, this this would be a good way. But North Korea really perceives the U.S. presence in South Korea to be the, the much greater threat. So uh, they don't see as much of a threat coming from the South Korean government itself, but uh, through it's, it's through Seoul's alliance with Washington um, that they see the greater threat. And... Uh, um, and this is something that, that of course, we, we should not question. This is not something. This is not something we should ever consider um, uh, abandoning. Uh, Seoul is 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 uh, one of one of our, our greatest allies, not just in the region but um, in the world. And 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 um, uh, it is a uh, relationship that has, um, uh, I think, uh, done more good than anything. Um, both. Um, in terms of, of bringing about, you know, or helping to to um, uh, really introduce democratic values to to South Korea, uh, bring about economic prosperity to the region, um, and and security, uh, and this is something we should never question, uh, e despite North Korean concerns. as Americans our trust the Chinese or our assumption that it's China that is going to be the conduit sort of misplaced based on evidence right. um, but what about uh, the response of other regional powers you know as an internationalist I have long believed that it's the US's uh, attempt at least in foreign policy to strengthen other powers mm. rather than intervening in North Asia directly. So won't that run contrary to our whole policy of trying to strengthen our direct Well, let me be clear that I think the United States needs to work very closely with Seoul in uh, coordinating um, uh, and, and should keep Seoul informed at, at every stage of, of talks with, with North Korea. Uh, again, I think that is you know, a crucial relationship and, and Seoul has 
more interest than than anyone uh, you know on the on the peninsula. So, um, but what we're looking at here again is, um, you know, do we do we do we risk um, uh, North Korea continuing to to escalate tensions and 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 continuing to de destabilize the region and and the potential. Um, uh, continuation of humanitarian crises in North Korea, or or do we do we deal with do we try, try to solve the situation? And and what we can see is that unfortunately we have taught North Korea that the most effective way to get to uh, achieve their diplomatic goals is to engage in provocative behavior like they are. Um, and this really goes back to the late 1960s when the North Koreans seized the USS Pueblo. Um, you can see from the diplomatic record that North Korea fully expected, this is, the USS Pueblo was a surveillance ship that was operating in the, the East Sea um, uh, off the coast of Korea between Japan and Korea um, uh, in 1968. Uh, it was seized in international waters. The North Koreans allege that it actually um, infiltrated North Korean waters. There's no evidence that I've seen of this. Um, but the North Koreans seize it, and they expected us to retaliate militarily. They expected us um, to, to you know, carry out surgical strikes or to, or to try to, to get the ship back. We know this because we can see in the in diplomatic record of uh, uh, Romania, East Germany, and other countries where they're telling embassies to uh, to evacuate their non-essential personnel. They're in, they're telling them to build bunkers. Uh, in the embassies. They're actually evacuating Pyongyang. They're building up fortifications throughout the country. Not only did the United States not retaliate militarily, we actually sat down and negotiated with them for 11 months and gave them what they wanted. We, we admitted that we had hostile intentions toward North Korea. Um, fast forward a few years uh, to the early 1970s when North Korea tried to reach out directly to us and throughout the 70s and the 80s, and we ignored them. Um, uh, we can see the full evolution of their thinking, how they're learning um, how to deal, how, how to, to achieve their diplomatic goals when in the early 90s we have conversations with the Russians, no longer the Soviets, but with the Russians, where North Korea is already developing a nuclear weapons program. Um, the Russians are aware of this, and they're saying, "Look, you should you should enter into multilateral negotiations and negotiate away this this weapons program. You can get you know some some major concessions for this." And the North Koreans look to the Russians and, and essentially say, "Thanks very much, but this is none of your business. We're using this as leverage over the United States." So what you can see then is North Korea learned the lesson that the best way to get the attention of of the United States, and the best way to achieve their diplomatic goals is to is uh, to get, engage in provocative actions, not to um, not to try peaceful dis discussions. And um, and the North Koreans believe that that it is only in dealing with the United States that this can happen. Um, so. Uh, yes, we can continue to try to strengthen other partners in the regime. We can work with others. But at the same time, we need to accept the reality that North Korea is not going to give up its, this, this, they're not going to abandon their, their, their policies until some of their concerns are addressed. Uh, and they feel that there is this existential crisis presented by, or, uh, or dilemma presented by the, the, the uh, U.S. Uh, and and um, uh, the the fact that there is no uh, treaty after the Korean War, we are technically still at war. Uh, there was only an armistice that ended the Korean War, um, so they want a peace treaty. They want to sit down and directly and talk directly with the United States and 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 have normalized relations and eliminate for them what is this security, this existential. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, dilemma, and um, that's only by talking directly with the United States that that's going to happen. No one else can really address their their major concerns, um, and and unfortunately, we taught them the lesson again that the most effective way to to achieve their goals is to engage in provocative actions, uh, and 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 unfortunately, we're the only ones that can really solve the problem. Um, 
Now, it can be part of a broader process in, involving other countries. We have the six-party process that um, met from two, or that worked from 2003, I think, until 2009, with with some limited success, um, particularly when um, the U.S. and North Korea met on the sidelines. Here, though, you have the problem of of the host. Uh, China is the host, and um, there's also uh, another problem with the six-party process. I think is um, the, the thinking in the United States and, and in other countries that uh, that it's it's more balanced, that it's actually balanced. You have on the one side you have the U.S., Japan, and South Korea. On the other side you have North Korea, China, and Russia. We think of it as North Korea and its partners, and the U.S. and its partners. The North Koreans don't see it that way. They see it as you know, us and five schoolyard bullies, because they've had problems with all parties, including China, but also Russia. Um, there were many periods in, in, in Cold War history and, and after where the North Koreans felt Russia was also overly interventionist. And, and, uh, and then, of course, obviously, they, the, the North Koreans have problems with, with South Korea, with Japan, and with the United States. So it, for the North Koreans, it's not so balanced. Um, it's not the, the best or the most ideal venue. Um, and, you know, you have to look at it as, you know, so again, five schoolyard bullies saying, hey, look, you know, we're no longer, we're no longer bullies. We're not going to push you around. Oh, hold on. Libya. <laughs> okay, you have my attention again. Um, and then, uh, you know, so give up, give up the one thing that you have that's going to, um, uh, to, you know, uh, defend you. And, and, um, this is how the North Koreans perceive it. And this is something that we need to uh, understand a bit more. You know, try to think a bit more vicariously. And you know, these historical documents, I think, really help us do that. Um, so, other questions? Great. Uh, we have another question from Northern Michigan University. And I think um, really ask what the documents can tell us. Um, very interesting question. Uh, in repressed countries, Sometimes art and literature emerge from underground distant communities. Are there any such, is there any evidence that there are underground distant communities in North Korea? Um, to use uh, Paolo Freire's words, is there any evidence of conscientization among the North Korean people of their plight? Uh, it's difficult to know. Um, because we don't have, we have, we have very limited direct access to um, North Koreans, to um, North Korea, you know, those who do travel to North Korea are kept on a tight leash, um, and, and so there's no real way to meet with, with, with uh, uh, people who may actually uh, be dissidents. We um, do know through the defector community that there are some, that there is some dissent, but uh, it's so difficult to to organize. Um, the regime um, has has just built up so much distrust among even neighbors, and 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 these reporting um, uh, these systems where you're you're reporting on on one another, and and um, I mean mothers and and children betray one another um, for having hostile thoughts of the regime and whatnot. It's uh, so much mistrust in North Korea. It, it's such a, um, it, where it's, it, it's just almost impossible to organize and to, um, uh, to really, uh, um, I don't know that, that, that you would ever see any, any large movement against the leadership. Although, I mean, I, we've seen some evidence over the years of, uh, I remember there was um, a video that was that was um, released a couple of years ago where there was a, an image of Kim Jong Il which had graffiti on it, um, but this is not something that that we're aware of that is certainly widespread, sadly. You know, you, you pointed out the mistrust between the countries. And then I think that's not just uh, China and North Korea. There are 
you know, like six way, five way mistrust in that region in East Asia, for example, North and South Korea, for right. sure. And then the US and then China, Japan, China, Japan, North Korea. Only yeah. some, you know, the amiable relationship or historically that exists in the region is North, uh, South Korea and the US. Right. They are very economic, you know, closely economic allies, and then they have, you know, a long-standing the relationship, very close relationship. That, but because of, uh, you know, some, the South Korea has a very combative politics, and then they have to rely on it. It has to, you know, rely on China as well as uh, the U.S. for their uh, economic viability to mm -hmm. survive in this, you know, very hostile economic environment. So in that sense, I, you know, uh, when you said that U.S. has to use some different leverage to make meaningful changes in North Korea. And then I, uh, in that sense, I think South Korea shouldn't be the only way the U.S. should use or rely on to make some changes in that region. So somehow, you know, some other people, I, I believe, even scholars believe that rather than relying on and then strategically saying that, okay, we, we will coordinate every step we make with South Korea. And then some people are doubtful about the effectiveness of doing that because it has been doing, the U.S. has been doing the same thing for many decades and it has not been that effective. Not just because, you know, inability of the U.S., but also that very complicated relationship there. Uh, I understand that you know Wilson Center is not a public policy you know institute. It is more of scholarly institution, I think. But still, do you have you seen you know other like you know discussions in the scholarly as well as uh, discussions in cre created in that realm of public diplomacy and the institution that that can suggest some new move, new approach that U.S the U.S. can take in the future? Well, I, I, I personally, I think um, the U.S. should keep all regional partners abreast of, of, of actions and, and, and uh, uh, efforts to, to resolve the, the situation on the peninsula. But um, what, I, what I mean, though, is that uh, the U.S. needs to keep, some, because South Korea has the greatest, uh, this is not just an extension of, of the, the close alliance, but it's more, what I was suggesting is more recognition that South Korea has more to, to lose and more to gain on the peninsula than anyone else. Um, the U.S. needs to keep South Korea very, in, you know, very um, uh, informed about, um, about any uh, discussions. Um, South Korea's interests need to be kept in mind. This is something in, in, in the late 1960s we see um, actually uh, brought up about a great um, uh, deal of mistrust between South Korea and the United States. When, for example, um, when negotiating over the Pueblo, President Park Chung-hee was, was quite upset that we weren't also talking with the North Koreans about um, the uh, attempt just two days before the Pueblo was seized to assassinate him and his family, when 31 North Korean commandos snuck across the border into South Korea and made it just a couple hundred yards from, from the presidential compound. Um, uh, we, we didn't really pay much attention to that. We were just so focused on, on um, you know, we actually entered into talks, direct talks with the North Koreans to negotiate the, uh, the release of, of the crew of, of the U.S.'s Pueblo but didn't really bring up this attempted assassination. And this really bothers the South Koreans. So I think the lesson that we could learn from that is, you know, we need to bring to the table also South Korea's concerns, but also keep them very informed um, of, of, of all developments. We can also see just, um, I, I, to my great surprise, and I think this is a very positive development, uh, just recently, um, not sure, we don't know exactly when these talks occurred, perhaps in, in, in late 2015. The United States, after some years, and after we had talks in 2012 with the North Koreans, and um, uh, there was a, a leap day agreement, and that 
um, uh, collapsed. But uh, after four years, um, the United States began talking with the North Koreans again and, and even put on the table the possibility of uh, a peace treaty and possibly also the normalization of relations. Um, and and uh, uh, the North Koreans rejected the, the proposal um, for, for U.S.-North Korea dialogue. Um, this is something, uh, this is not unusual. They, they did it because they were just about to carry out another nuclear test, and they wanted to actually first strengthen their position before entering into, into this dialogue with the United States. And don't be surprised if very soon we see the North Koreans saying, okay, we're now ready to return to the, to the table. What they don't understand is that it takes a long time for the current administration to get over, you know, any any bruise or wounds or any hurt egos, um, or hurt, you know. Uh, and so, I, I wouldn't expect the U.S. to to uh, accept that re that offer after the North Koreans turned us down. But what we saw, though, is that um, South Korea was quite upset about the fact that we were talking on the side with the North Koreans and didn't keep them fully informed. So I think it's um, because, of, uh, again, um, uh, South Korea has more to lose on the peninsula than, than anyone. So I think it's very important to, to keep um, our South Korean partners um, informed, as well as other regional partners and, and, and other regional players, including China, uh, which also has... Uh, strong interests um, on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Dr. Person, I want to thank you for a very insightful and timely uh, presentation this morning, and I want to thank the World Affairs Council of West Michigan for making this opportunity available to us at Hope College, and also extend my appreciation to all of you who've joined us on the live stream today for this event. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.